Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I have uh, Dr. Omar Zaid with me. I know a lot of you have been waiting for this day, uh, telling me over and over again, uh, when are you going to bring Dr. Zaid? One brother even commented, did something happen between you and Dr. <laughs> Omar? And I was like, no, nothing happened. Uh, mm. You know, my YouTube videos were down and then uh, by the time I was working on other channels and then, you know, it just was getting, uh, I was getting back into the mode of, of mm. YouTube and uh, um, so, if, as you know, I only recently started doing their interviews again. I think only did one uh, with Brother Jalil just recently and, uh, and then before that, Brother Muhammad Latif, uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Latif and, uh, and so, now I'm here back with Dr. Omar, and uh, today's topic is going to be, as you know, uh, I have talked about this several times, the Prophet said that there will come a time where the one who is laying down and is in a better state than the one who is sitting and is in a better state than the one who is standing, than the one who is running. And then he says at that time, people will wake up in the morning as a believer and go to sleep as a non-believer. Mm and vice versa, almost describing in some ways, Dr. Omer, like the situation we have today, where if you're on the, you know, you're laying down, you're not connected to anything, and then if you're sitting, you're connected to your phone, and then if you're like, you know, uh, walking, you're connected to more devices, and this information then challenges people's faith, and it's, it's exactly like this, overnight people are changing. Mm. Especially after this whole situation we find ourselves, which I can't say on YouTube, uh, but you know what I mean by mm. this particular situation. And so I wanted to, and because I am dealing with uh, cases where young people who have mm. lived their uh, Islamic life, uh, you know, up to their teens or early 20s, uh, have lived a pretty good Islamic life, but now all of a sudden, I guess because they're stuck at home and they're reading X, Y, Z, they're questioning their faith. Mm. And this is a worldwide phenomenon that's happening, and I'm getting calls all over the all the time on this mm. issue. Mm. So people want to know about suffering. They want to know about, um, you know, why is there hellfire? Uh, one person asked me, "Is God evil?" Also. <laughs> And, uh, mm. you know, so I'll just let you speak. I mean, I, I kind of gave an introduction, but, you know, what are your thoughts on this issue? And and what would be your advice to parents at this time? Oh, gosh. This is a, a big, What would big... your advice be to imams at this time? <laughs> this is, this is a what big... would be your advice to somebody we're dealing with that says, you know, I have come to the conclusion that there is a God, but he's evil. Like, this is also... Yeah, evil. well... This, uh, first of all, in people who are thinking that way, uh, they're lost. And um, there's many reasons for, for being lost. Uh, the chief reason for being mis lost is misguidance. And um, so who's responsible for guidance, you see? Well, it's the elders of the community. It's the leaders. It's the politicians, it's the governors, it's the teachers, uh, it's the doctors, it's the uh, judiciary. These are the ones who are supposed to be guiding people. And when the people lose their faith, it's the result of misguidance. Now, oh, well, gosh, Muslims are losing their faith, which means... Dr. Omar, if what you're saying is true, the leaders are misguiding them, and uh, yeah, this is what's taking place. When the youth see that their leaders cannot be trusted, they will lose faith. Because mm. there's, no, there's no honor in uh, misplaced trust. There's no honor to be found in leadership that is uh, dishonoring the truth that is uh, dishonoring uh, al-Hizbah, that's dishonoring justice, that is not enforcing what is good and preventing what is evil. 
So when the youth see that, it doesn't matter how many recitations they've made, how much of the Quran they've memorized or what the Hadith has uh, been memorized, if it's not being enforced, if what they're reciting is not being lived, then what value is it, you see? They, they don't see any value in it. They lose, uh, they, they, it's a, when the leaders dishonor the faith that they express publicly by not assuring justice and by not substantiating and enforcing what is true, then the youth who are coming up, although they're not f full of wisdom and knowledge and such, this is not important. What's important is they, they understand the difference between what is just and what is unjust. That can be seen. They understand the difference between what is true and what is not true. And when they see that they're, for example, if a son comes home and uh, he sees that his uh, father is abusing his mother for so many years, and the father is supposedly uh, a leader in the masjid. Well, during the childhood years up to the late period, uh, this is somewhat acceptable. But when they get in, when they reach adolescence, they begin to think in terms of uh, value, and this value is me measured according to justice. Hmm. And if the man is not executing justice in the home, how can he do it in the street? You see. You, you know, if a man comes home and he beats his wife, you know, takes a backhand and crosses her across the, fa the face with his backhand, you know, this is not a toothpick, okay? You, are you hearing me? This is not a toothpick. And if he does it with his tongue, that's even worse, because that's psychological terror, you see? So there's no justice in that. And when the boy or the daughter sees this, and uh, they see that, well, this man is expressing uh, piety, he's expressing faith, uh, but he treats his own family like this, and he treats the woman who's closest to him, his closest companion like this, in an unjust manner, in an inhumane way, and counter to everything that he's being taught uh, in his school, his Islamic schools, what is the uh, the, 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 the habit, the, the behavior of the Prophet, salam. how is he going to justify this? Especially when the men in the mosque support this man, who's supposedly his father, who is his father. So when he mm. sees this, and then when Actually, he sees... I see a lot of cases like that. Yeah, I'm sure. And when you, when you, <laughs> when he's, when the son sees this, and then when he sees the whole, the whole leadership of the Juma are backing down from justice on the, on the public square. You see, what what use is his faith? Mm. Yeah, what use is it? This is, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything because uh, there's no power in it. That no. means it's it's impotent. You see, the men are impotent, even though they're even though they can uh, rape their wives. Okay, and I say that conscientiously. Uh, what's interesting uh, yes. is that uh, you reminded me of ver a verse in the Quran uh. in which the, the, the two commands are given to the Prophet in that particular uh -huh. whole surah, Sutur Shura. Yes. One is Aqimud Deen, establish the Deen. Establish. Uh. And then, فَذَلِكَ فَذُوْ وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا Call people to justice. Yes. And then it says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُرِثُ الْكِتَابِ Those people who inherit the Book of Allah they will be in doubt that this is the book of Allah if you don't do this. Yes. Yes, if you don't do it, you see. This is something that uh, Muslims have forgotten, especially the Arabs. They've forgotten it. Because the Quran says, look, you know, you, you can, Allah will replace you. He'll replace you. And if you don't uphold justice, you see, it doesn't mean he doesn't say Allah. Allah doesn't say if you don't pray five times a day, I'm going to I'm going to replace you. He says if you don't uphold justice, you will be replaced. 
Okay. Also, what's very interesting about that in, in terms of childhood uh, is that one of the most common phrases you hear from little kids, and I was reading this mm -hmm. when I was in my university, I read about this, that one of the most common phrases you hear children say to the parents is, that is not fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, you gave it to him and not her. Or, or Yeah, like well. The sense of justice is really The sense of great. justice is there, and, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this thing that if it's not handled appropriately, it becomes communism. Because, uh, you know, what one child deserves is not the same as another child deserves, but they want to treat, be treated, everyone wants to be treated equally. And Allah does not treat everybody equally. <laughs> mm. You know, there's a hierarchy, of, uh, there's a divine order, and there's people who are smarter, there's people who are stronger, there's people who are uh, 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 more capable, there are people who are wiser, and these cannot be treated equally, and the, the Quran makes that quite clear as well. It was one of the remarkable things that I liked when I, I, I read it as a, an early convert. Um, children want what is fair, <coughs> and this has, to be, this has to be modified according to what each one deserves, you see. Mm. So, and then, you know, what happens with uh, Muslim wives is they say, oh, that husband, he's not fair. And uh, he bought her a new car. I mean, he, he bought the second wife a used car. Da, 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 you know. And, and, you know well, at least they've got cars, you see. <laughs> and <laughs> at least they've, you know, um, for example, uh, let's just take this in, the, in the, 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 the child who's not taught about justice and fairness correctly becomes a woman and she enters into a multiple marriage and uh, her, the first wife is a doctor who works in a um, dangerous environment, shall we say, someplace in South Chicago, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, the husband wants to make sure that she's safe, so he he hires, he buys her a Mercedes, and maybe even hires a bodyguard to make sure that she gets in and out of the hospital correctly. Okay, so the second wife, uh, you know, she's just uh, an ordinary, uh, uh, shall I say, run-of-the-mill housewife. No, <laughs> that's not a fair statement, but you you get the idea. She's not a professional. She does. She's not endangered in the same situation. So. The, the husband buys her, you know, uh, a small sedan that gets her safety to the shopping mall. But she tells, she complains to all her family members, look, he bought her a Mercedes and I only get a little Dodge Comet or whatever the case might be. Mm. You know, they're both lucky to have what they have. It's both is a blessing. And they both don't deserve a Mercedes. The second wife doesn't deserve the Mercedes. Okay. Because uh, she's not in that the kind of, or maybe the woman is a, a diplomat and the husband is being wise in the decision as to what he provides for her. So, you know, when the second wife compare, uh, complains about this, it's like the, the child who says, you gave her three jelly beans and I only have one. It's not fair. Uh, please, grow I up. I remember in my philosophy class. Grow up. Yeah, go on. In, in my philosophy class, uh, there was an example to what you're alluding to yeah. that if there's a, 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 a big person and a small person and you say, okay, you're going to have equal amount of food, yeah. <laughs> well, then that won't be very equal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it won't be justice. It'll be yeah. equal. No, it's not justice at all. Yeah, people have got the, the wrong ideas because they're, they're not thinking correctly and anymore. I think in the West, there's so much emphasis on equal, 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 yeah, that, yes. that e idea of equal goes beyond the limits of what is actually just. Well, it goes beyond the limits of what is real, okay, mm. and what is, uh, what is possible and what is practical. It's not, it's not possible for everyone to be equally treated equally. Justice is to treat everyone uh, on the scale of justice equally. So, so that, uh, for example, if, you're, uh, if you conscientiously murder someone, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you're going to face the hangman's noose. So that's equal, that's equal treatment under justice, you see. Otherwise, this idea of, you know, what's fair doesn't really matter. But I, we're getting a little bit off the top topic here because 
I wanted to bring up uh, this whole idea of, uh, go back to the whole idea of misguidance. And misguidance has to do with the misplacement of trust. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote a book on this. It's, inshallah, it will be uh, published uh, sometime relatively soon. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that's really, really needed in this time uh, for people to increase their understanding because trust has been misplaced. Mm. That's one of the reasons we're having this current crisis, which is just digging a bigger hole for everyone. Mm. And it's because we've misplaced our trust in lying authorities. They're mm. liars. Mm. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, this Fauci fellow, he's a liar. He's a Jesuit. They're professional liars. They're the father of lies. Um, they're, you know, that's just the way it is. You trace his history, you find out how deep these lies run. Mm. You follow the money and you find out what a, what kind of a liar he really is. Mm. And the whole country is uh, dependent upon <laughs> this liar. Look, look what he's done to the nation. It's incredible. And, you know, you, we're, we're being governed by the stupid and we're being uh, forced, pushed by morons, you know, to wear the face mask whenever we're out in a public venue. That's, 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 that's a, a reversal of divine order, and it's all because of misplaced trust. Trust begins in the womb. It begins in the womb. Trust is this amana. It's the basis of Islam, is it not? Mm, of course it is. Amana is the basis of Islam. The uh, the prophet was called the trusted one, the trusted one. Everyone trusted him. The the pagans, the heathens, the Jews, everybody trusted him. Everyone. He was trustworthy, called the trustworthy. And this trust is a gift from Allah. What does it represent? It represents our ability to fulfill the promises made by God to Adam. He says, you, if you do this, you become my faithful servant. I will take care of you. Okay. So the infant comes into the world and he expects, he or she expects to be taken care of. It's their right. Okay. And they expect to be taken care of in a proper, uh, manner, in a just manner. Okay. They don't expect to be mistreated. They don't expect to be lied to. They expect to have the, f the, the promise of God fulfilled that their needs, their requirements, that is going to enable them to become a worthwhile, trustworthy servant of Allah are, is going to be provided by their parents and their immediate family and their community which we're referring to the common wheel. So when trust is uh, not, uh, not enabled, when it's misplaced, when guidance is, becomes misguidance, trust is misplaced in the, those who provide the misguidance, you see. Does lack of love play a role in this? Well, that's a whole different topic. I covered that in my new uh, book on sexology. Love has three components, and without all three components, it's not love. Uh, the greatest scholars have said, uh, for example, like Al Ghazali, he said, if you if you're loving somebody just because you're expecting uh, something in return, this is not love. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Ghazali made that uh, very very clear. That's not love. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a, a business deal. <laughs> okay, that's not love. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you have to have, you have to have this component of love which is spiritualized. And what I mean spiritualized is that, uh, that component honors what is trustworthy, <laughs> what is, uh, valuable. Okay. Not what, not in a material sense, but in the sense that provides for the common wealth, the common wheel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this is what the Chinese, they, they would call it uh, Gong Jing. Uh, it is a, uh, a reflection of 
a respect for all life. And the respect for all life that goes so far as to you and those around you know that you're all involved in providing for everyone else's needs, you see. And this brings me to uh, the Amish, whom I admire, and I've frequently called them the best Muslims I've ever met, actually, uh, because Princeton did a study of the Amish because they're, they're the longest living um, a private uh, cultural group in America, and uh, they're successful, and they wondered why they were so, so successful. And a lot of people would automatically think, well, it's because they're Christians. Well, no, that's not what the reason, reason was. Sociologists determined that the reason that they were, the real reason they were successful and have these communities that are successful now for four or five hundred years is because they met, met, they met everyone's needs. Mm. And their elders would meet on a regular basis and do what the first caliphs did, you see. They would walk the streets and make sure everyone was fed. Mm. They would make sure everyone was clothed, make sure that everyone was sheltered, mm. you know. So this is what caused the success. In those groups, you see, the elders uh, assigned responsibilities to certain other of the younger men, and the younger men were responsible for maybe a group of ten families or whatever, and they would report to the elders, well, family number two ha doesn't have enough uh, of this, that, or next thing, and the community would make sure that that need was met, mm. you see. Oh, so-and-so just lost her husband. The crop hasn't been harvested. She needs help to bring in the crop. So all the men would go to that field and bring in the crop, mm. harvest it for her. And then they would make sure that she was not without protection, mm. okay? That e either she was taken in by a, a, a relative and protected, or she was remarried mm. at the earliest possible uh, 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 moment, okay? Mm. So these, the, 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 the thing that's missing, you see, in the lives of the children that you're discussing with me, that you brought up earlier in our conversation, that are losing their faith, it's, it's, it's because their needs aren't being met. Mm -hmm. And when needs aren't being met, that means that justice is not being exercised. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there's, there's no al hizbah And without al hizbah there's the walls of Islam, you know, they collapse. There are no walls. Mm -hmm. So that means the people who are supposed to be inside will leave, and the people who are not supposed to be there will come in, mm. you see. So you've got a real problem here when you have your children leaving your faith. It's because your leaders have failed in the job of guiding them. And talking about the Amish, yes, uh, it's so interesting because they allow their kids to leave the 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 wilderness and come into the city mm -hmm. and make a choice if they want to go back or stay in the city yes and majority of them go back they go back yeah because once they've been brought up in a in an environment that's close to nature and then they go into the city and it's divorced from nature it it's divorced from allah because allah is manifest in the nature it's, allah does not manifest in the city mm. okay uh the it is the natural environment in which man is involved in husbandry now what i'm talking about there is the care of the environment the care of animals the care of whatever it might be the farmer the husbandman the the person who takes care and is close to nature okay for example uh, the native uh, whether they're Native American, whoever the indigenous people are, they can read the forest like a book, mm. you see. And that's a different kind of intelligence. Mm. They can tell you what this tree means, what that animal means, what, what it represents. They know the characteristics of everything. So they are exercising the Adamic uh, command. Mm which is adab, you mm. see, putting things in order. Mm. 
when you're in the city, there's no order, it's chaos. You, 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 you can't put, you can't appreciate the divine order when you're in, when, when you're in the city, it's lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city is governed by, as we know, the Quran makes it very clear, it's governed by its wicked men in high places. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So the Amish elders, they realized this and they said, we're, we're not going to go there. Mm -hmm. We've left and, um, uh, there's no point in, you know, being anywhere near the city. We're going to make our lives uh, in the country, in the rural. We're going to establish our rural communities. And they've done it. And they've done it on the basis of meeting everyone's needs, which is the exercise of uh, uh, justice, the exercise of hisba, And that makes them trustworthy, mm. you see. So when needs go unmet... The leaders are not trustworthy. And when the people under their uh, auspices are mistreated, and forced to throw up, wear the mask, you see, uh, they're not trustworthy. Mm. This is misplaced trust. And we're misplacing our trust in the corporate culture right now. And this corporate culture has nothing to do with divine order. It's the exact opposite. It is the order of al Dajjal. That's what it is. Mm. So um, when these young people are confronted with the lack of fairness, they finally get to a point in adolescence where they, they, they may not understand all the um, salient, more salient, subtle points of philosophical differences between this and that, the next thing. But they know when a husband comes home and smacks the wife in the mouth, they know this is not justice. Yeah. Okay. What they don't. The, they don't need any explanation. You see, Doctor Omer. Uh, yeah. What about love? Because a lot of times I see that. Oh yeah. Uh, love and care is also missing in these people. Oh, well, you see, especially in this situation where you have a dominant culture, mm -hmm. and then Muslims are like a subculture, and. And, and they feel like their parents didn't love them and they want to move on to something else. Yeah, yeah. That's because there's a lack of affection. This is another aspect of, of love. You see, the first aspect of love is honor. Mm -hmm. And honor depends on al hisba and al hisba depends on the divine order, mm -hmm. okay, and knowledge and wisdom, mm -hmm. okay. So it doesn't depend on recitation. It doesn't depend on praying five times a day. Not at all. Okay. Mm. Those are acts which help you, uh, if you've got the right intention, to establish discipline mm. so that you can then exercise wisdom. And in exercising wisdom, you affect justice, you see. So if you're not doing that, if you're, if you're just doing, going through the motions, praying five times a day so everybody sees you as a good Muslim, <laughs> and you're, you're making the recitation, but it doesn't go past the throat because it doesn't enter the heart and then become part of the will after you digest the truth and then activate it, you know, you're, you're wasting your time. So what's, Honor is for the people who do that, and these are the people who should be in positions of responsibility as responsible leaders, okay? Because not everybody has the capability to discipline themselves in that way, okay? But uh, without the adab uh, being exercised, then uh, Professor Alatas from Malaysia uh, one of their greatest intellectuals, if not the greatest, oh, yeah, made yeah. this uh, made this very very clear. If adab is not ordered, if you don't practice the adamic naming and scientifically establishing what this is, what its purpose is, and then putting it in its particular place, including people, okay, mm -hmm. you're going to get the worst of people in positions of leadership. And that's what's happened now. That's that's where we are. It's one of the reasons you had this problem. So there's a lack. We're honoring the wrong people. Okay, so that's the first aspect of love. Love is uh, defined by three uh, three uh, uh, components, and honor is the first component. That's reverence for divine order. Mm. This reverence for what the Chinese call the uh, the the Tao or the Way. 
and in Islam is also called the way. The way of what? The way to heaven. Okay. So let me dig yeah. into this particular point. The first of the three, the idea of honor yes. is okay. If I honor my wife, let's say, yes, that means that I am, I am upholding the divine order. Yes, and yes. that relationship we have in that divine order. Yes, yes. So, so it's it's not just a matter of. Uh, I love her and she loves me. There's a third party in a sense. Yes, which yes. Is the, well, the, the third party is, is, is the, Allah because He Allah designed is, the whole thing. And, and it's and so the marriage itself is an entity that you're you're honoring yes. the marriage itself. Yes, yes. And then this this is why marriage is half the deen. You see, because then that honor that honor component then pours out into the street, as the the other half of the deen. And you can't separate them. You can't, you can't say, okay, well, I've been unmarried for 50 years now and, uh, you know, I'm practicing the deen. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You, if you want to practice the deen, you've got to be like all the other people who followed the prophets who were married. Okay. You become, if you want to be a slave to Allah, you become a slave to the prophet who's married. Okay. Don't and so you know there are a lot of people who say well you know I follow such and such and such the Imam such and such and I say well where's his wife because the first thing I want to know about a man is where's his wife you see oh well he's not married well he can't be an Imam hmm. he can't be this there's no there's no dean there because the dean comes by virtue of experience of the intimate human relationship you hmm. see between husband and wife. If you don't have that, you don't, you're missing the point. Mm. The, my sunnah is, is marriage. Marriage is my sunnah, is what the man said. Yes, is it not? Yes. Of course. So don't, uh, just shut up. Don't talk to me about this. I don't care who you are, young man. If you're not married, shut up until you are. And you know, you can enter then into a position of responsibility after you've showed me the first, first batch of children that you've raised. Then I'll listen to you, okay? That's what it's about. Because a man isn't matured until he's 40, all right? Is that right? Yeah. So don't give me these young men running out around there and talking about the marriage. They don't know anything about it yet. <laughs> they don't know anything about it yet. So this, um, we're talking about honor. The other part of this is affection. The second part of love is affection. This is a soulish uh, uh, element, and it means that, you know, you want to touch somebody, you you feel close to them. Acknowledge them. You know, you can honor somebody that you never touch, okay? Uh, and you honor, for example, you, you honor the king, you honor the president, you honor so-and-so if they're honorable, okay? The problem we're having now is we're honoring the wrong people <laughs> because of misplaced trust. So um, the second component of love is affection. You have affection for your, if you have a dog, you love your dog, this is affection. And the dog has an affection for you. What will you, you this is a soulish realm, there's nothing wrong with it. You see, you're meeting each other's emotional needs and this affection is expressed when we have a baby and, you know, the baby comes out and the baby wakes up after a few days and begins to smile and you're, you're, you're touching the baby, you touch the baby, oh, and you talk to the baby and you're, this is, the, well, what are we doing? We're teaching the baby to be sexual, you see. This is, this is sexual affection, but it's not sexual yet, it's sensual. Okay, and the baby is feeling this, you see, and when the baby feels this, the baby responds, mm -hmm. and the baby then wants to feel it some more, and so this affection then grows, and when the when you show the affection, the baby smiles, the baby coos, and you know you do the same sort of thing, and then you start playing with the baby, you tickle the baby. Well, that's what husbands and wives do when they're in bed alone; they tickle each other. All right. So this all leads to the third component, which is sexuality. You see, so without honor, without without affection, and affection is dependent upon what? It's dependent. Why is the baby happy that they're, they're touched? Because the person who's touching them is going to meet their needs. Mm. Okay. 
So this has to do with trust. Mm. Okay? Has everything to do with amana. So that's the second component of love. The first component is honor. Honor doesn't come right away. Honor has to be earned, doesn't it? Mm. Because trust has to be earned. Mm. So the effort, but the first thing that comes with affection is is the is the uh, the soulish uh, uh, meeting of needs. Okay, I'm a baby. I'm naked. Uh, I'm in a new environment. There's a new world. I don't know who can I trust here. Oh, here's the touch. It's okay, little one, whatever your name is, little Mary, here, here. Then the mama gives it the nipple, and the baby eats. Lo and behold, Allah's word is being fulfilled. You see? And trust is born, along with affection. So affection and trust are like this. They're like that. So is sexuality. You see? It's all together. And so without affection, without sensuality and sexuality, there is no deen. <laughs> it, it, it's not there. So all of these people going around there, you know, their, their, their marriages are falling apart or they're, they've never been married or they don't know how to love. It's because this is missing. Now, let's get to the third component. The third component is sexual sexuality. Sexuality is dependent upon what Allah has placed in each of us that goes down to a subatomic level. We discussed this earlier today in, in the motel room. And this has to do with tensor vibrational configurations that are complementary, that are complementary. So my vibes have to complement my wife's vibes. So these vibes, these are electromagnetic radiations, they come together and they say, hey, I like that girl. <laughs> hey, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can get it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, without getting street worthy here, <laughs> I think you understand what I'm, what I mean. Without that, this is one of the reasons, and listen to me, especially you Pakistani people, is one of the reasons marriages should never be forced. Never be forced. Because if this complementarity is not there, it's going to fail. And it'll fail even if they stay together for 70 years. Mm. And you know the old couples, they've never been happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, what do the women do? They say, well, I did it, you've got to do it. Well, that's the same thing that the old doctors say in the hospital. Well, I've done it. You got to do it. That's taklid. There's no reason in that. There's no science in it. It's far. It's divorced from divine order. So, that's just an introduction. If you if you want to really understand this, you need to read the book that I've just written. It's not published yet, but it's inshallah it will be. So you have three components. You have the honorable component, which is what the Christians call agape. This is the love of divine order. And it's expressed as honor for those, uh, honor for those people who actually meet the requirements of providing for everyone's welfare. Okay. And that's tied to affection because we love these people who deserve honor. Okay. Then the third component is sexuality. Hmm. So that's love. Without through without all three components, it's not love. It it just it just isn't. It's not there. Mm. Okay. So I hope I've made that essentially clear as an introduction. It needs further development. Mm. But I'm saying all of that because the, it's subject matter that's very important to be heard now, especially by the Ummah. Because why? Because your young people are leaving because. You men and you women, you don't understand this. You're reciting the Quran, you're memorizing the Hadith, and you don't know how to love? Allah created love. Hmm. He's, he authored it. He authored everything about it and everything that I've just explained and more. Hmm. Okay? And you think that praying five times a day and reciting the Quran is going to fulfill this need? It's going to fulfill the deen? No. 
This is why your children are leaving. Because you cannot practice al hizba if you don't honor the right leadership. And you can't have the right leadership if they don't know how to love. Yeah, okay? Is that tawheed enough for you? Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. It's a very deep subject. It needs to be understood. And it's not difficult to understand it. Hmm. If you want to be stubborn <laughs> and say it's not important, well, that's fine. If you want to continue with your chauvinist attitudes and, you know, treat your wife as if she's a servant, you know, rather than your closest companion, you don't understand. Because in marriage, you have the best opportunity to perform good deeds for each other. That's where good deeds begin. They begin in the marriage bed. And from there, they metamorphose in a myriad of ways, through the children, through your relationship with your neighbors, everything. So all of that pours out into the street if you've got it right in the marriage bed. If you don't have it right in the marriage bed, you can't exercise the dean. All of what you're saying is crap. It's nonsense. Until you can exercise the dean at home and treat your companion, your closest companion, as your neighbor. It's your closest neighbor because that's who he or she is. Yeah. So all of this has to do with trust. All of it. Hmm. All of it has to do with trust. So if trust is there, then it's almost part of Fitra to believe in God. Yes. If, if trust now, is not there. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. If trust isn't there, the Fitra is being repressed. And when Fitra is repressed, people will reject the repressor. And if Islam is, if Islam to these children is being perceived as the oppressor and the repressor of Fitra. Hmm. Okay? So this chauvinism has to be exiled, has to be exiled from the Ummah if the Ummah is to express the love of God for his creatures hmm. and if his creatures are going to express the love and honor for our Creator, you see, it can't be done otherwise. Mm. Yeah? Allah designed it this way. And there's no way around it. There's no way around it. So, um, a lot of people, when they leave Islam, they talk about what they're really talking about is what they feel internally. Yes. And but they use the concepts provided to them by the dominant culture. Yes. Uh, so they'll talk about suffering and if God is evil and why is there hellfire and mm. like one of the brothers I know or children I know, uh, you know, talks about, well, I'm doomed to be in the hellfire. <laughs> yeah. I, I've done so much wrong. I'm just, mm. I know I'm doomed. I'm uh -huh. just doomed. Yeah. Yeah. And so I might as well, you know. Well, they, they lose hope. Okay. They lose hope. They lose hope. And uh, that's also because uh, there's a lack of proper leadership, uh, proper uh, examples, proper role models. They're not there. You know, they're looking for them, but they don't find them. Uh, young men, young women, they need a role model. They want to emulate. Children want to emulate their elders as they do it naturally. Okay? Uh, one of my favorite pictures that I have on my computer that uh, rotates with a, a lot of other my uh, wall, wallpapers is uh, uh, two men walking down the street. They've got their hands, they're in a conversation, they've got their hands clasped behind their back, they're bent forward listening to each other, mm. and there's a little four-year-old boy following behind them, mm. okay? And he's in the same posture oh. as the men. Mm. Hands behind his back, head down, and he's following them. Mm -hmm. You see? Children do this naturally. It's fitra. So when we, when children start to um, emulate their elders, and then they get to a certain point where the elder 
uh, begins to uh, practice and regularly practice, habitually practice injustice, the fitra is becoming uh, confused. Mm. This is not fitra any longer. This is some sort of uh, evil conditioning, you see, mm. that uh, that doesn't allow the justice. So um, children then, they, they will rebel against this. They won't even understand that they're rebelling. Mm. They'll just do it by virtue of fitra because they're at least honest, you see. Uh, the real honest kid is the is the one who joins a gang. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you. Uh, they're they're probably because they're what they're doing is they're trying to replace the family because they can't trust the family. Mm. They think they can trust the gang. Well, to a certain extent they can, but um, the gang is not the divine order. Mm. The divine order is marriage. And, and so, in the same way, a lot of people will leave Islam and join. For example, a Christian group, not yes. necessarily because they yes. agree, <laughs> but because some of their needs are being met. Some their needs are going to be met, and that's the second aspect of love. You see, yeah. so they develop an affection for that group, uh, and they th they misplace this affection for what is honorable, and uh, the only thing that's honorable is divine order. Mm. You see, and to a certain extent. Uh, Christians are very good at uh, meeting needs, much better than many Muslim groups that I've mm. seen. Matter of fact, when I was in Malaysia, the Christians were meeting uh, more needs than the Muslim groups were. Um, I remember I, I became uh, associated with the Dakwa group, and they wanted me to uh, become involved with them. And one of their leaders, uh, uh, the financial boss of the Dakwa, he was dressed in a pinstripe suit, just like a Wall Street fellow, you know. And this is Malaysia, in Kuching, Malaysia, I met this guy. And um, he asked me, he said, why, why are our missions failing? Why are the Christian missions doing so much better than, than, than our uh, Dakwa workers? And I said, it's because your, your Dakwa workers are not meeting the needs of the people. Mm. When they enter a village and they find an old uh, widow, who's living in a ramshackle uh, uh, house that needs a new roof, she doesn't need the Koran, she needs a new roof. Mm. Okay? So, you, the Christians, they walk in, they see that she needs a new roof, they don't beat her over the head with Jesus, they give her a new roof. Okay? And I said, your people are walking into her kitchen expecting to be fed. <laughs> I said, this is what's wrong. You've got the, they've got the wrong priority. They're too arrogant. This is not humility, you see. So, if you're going to, and so your people, if you, if, if the Ummah is not meeting the needs of its children or its members, they're, they're going to leave. They, and they'll go and they'll become affectionately attached to another gang, another group that meets their needs. Mm. Okay? That feeds them. Okay? So, and, and feeds them with things that are not necessarily uh, pleasurable, but meets their needs. Now, when your needs are met, including sexual needs, you can become addicted to it for the wrong reasons, you see, because uh, of the pleasure centers in the, in the brain which are stimulated. Mm. If, this is all, if this is out of order, then you become addicted to another person. And this is not love. Addiction is not love, okay? Um, so many of these relationships are out of order, but they meet the second criteria for affection. Mm. And there's an, an appearance of honor, but it's, it's not really honor, because, well, what are these Christian groups doing? Well, they're saluting the flag, which is under the control of the people of our Dajjal, you see? And... Um, so their trust is being misplaced by virtue of another cult. Mm. All right? And I hope you followed me on that. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, I mean, we're creating a new cult as we speak. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you create a new cult, you see. And so they just move from one cult group to another. Well, the Amish are not a cult. They're a community. They're a living, working, breathing community 
in divine order and in harmonious divine order with the natural environment. Yeah? They're connected to the earth, which is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not connected to a paved street in the city. <laughs> you know, they're connected to the soil. And, you know, the beasties in the soil and uh, the cows in the, the, the meadow and, you know, whatever else they're taking care of. When they do their woodworking, they're connected to the wood. Hmm. You know, they don't use artificial materials. They want furniture. They cut, cut down the tree. They hew it into the proper form that they need, and then they put it together. They don't u even use hammers and nails. Their, their craftsmanship is so fine, they yes. fit the pieces together without hammers and nails. Yeah. Yeah? Have you ever seen a barn put up over the weekend by these people? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing, isn't we, it? We use them at our mosque for yeah. construction from time to Did time. Did you? Yeah. 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 There's Even much though the, the the New York State tries to put restrictions on them, ah. but they they have uh, better ethics, better they do a faster job, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. they don't cheat. You they know, don't cheat. No, they don't cheat. No. So their morals, their eth their ethics are excellent, and uh, Muslims would do well to learn from them, and even to send their young men to learn from them, yeah. if it was possible, if they would uh, uh, accept them. You see, so uh, I always uh, I told people, look, I'm back in the States now. I don't want to be here. Hmm. I'm going to tell you honestly, I feel like Eunice. <laughs> the whale swallowed me and spit me back up on the shores of New York and then brought me to Buffalo to this fella. And um, I don't want to be here, but I'm here because it's Allah's will, not because it's my will. You see, so... Um, the reason I'm saying that is because you have to have leaders who are willing to do things like that. And if they're not willing to do things like that, they're not in the right place with their niya. Okay? They're not in the right place. And they can't then guide their people appropriately, and your youth will lose their faith. They'll go through, even those who don't, you see, the boys you've just mentioned to me earlier today who professed uh, publicly that um, they, they, they've lost their faith and they don't believe in Islam or anything, they're being honest, you see. They don't worry me. What worries me is the people who've lost their faith and they still go through the motions. Mm. Okay? And your Juma. Your, your, the Ummah is filled with those kinds of people. Mm. They don't have the real faith. They don't have the faith that uh, will allow them to be honest enough to discuss what's really in their heart. And if they're not going to discuss what's really in their heart, they can't purify it. Mm. Okay? Which is what the, the Sufi goal is. Yeah? And if they can't purify the heart, they can't d discuss things honestly, then you can't have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship mm. with anyone. Mm. So you're just going through the motions. You might as well be a zombie. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's what the situation is. So the, the boys who have uh, rejected Islam, they're, they, they deserve more uh, of uh, an attentive conversation than those who are just going through the motions because they, the latter have become hypocrites and Allah hates hypocrites. So Allah will admire the boys who, who say, look, I, I, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe in Islam anymore. And, you know, so eventually someone's going to come to them and say, well, why? And they're going to, they'll, they'll open up and they'll say why. And then if they talk to somebody like me, uh, they'll, you know, I'll sit there and say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're wrong about rejecting Allah, but you're, you're right in your, in your conclusions, you see. And uh, if you sit here with me, I'll explain it to you, you see. Yeah. And um, so those, pe those, those young men are worth talking to. The other ones who are not uh, honest enough, 
you know, maybe they'll listen to somebody like me or yourself uh, and eventually come to a point where they're courageous enough to be honest and say something uh, that is truthful. Yeah, you know, and uh, then you can deal with it. You can deal with them. But you, you, if if they're not going to be truthful and honest with themselves, you you can't deal with them. You you, you know, you put up with them. You tolerate them. You know this sort of thing. I'm sure you do a lot of that. It must be hard on your um, uh, patients, <laughs> especially if you ha especially if you have elders who are like that. You see, and Islam is filled with elders like that, people who are going around uh, pretending to be pious and when in fact they've never had an honest day in their life. For, I mean, for decades and decades. They've just been going through the motions, pretending, 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 and not understanding, and not seeking further understanding. You see, this is a problem. Your young men who have rejected Islam they left because they were seeking understanding and nobody gave it to them. Mm. And this is a lack of true guidance. It's a lack of uh, true guidance. Anyway, we may be um, going on a little bit too long here. Yeah, probably... this was good for a first session. Uh -huh. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of comments. And I'm a lot sure. Of, like, welcome back, welcome back. <laughs> oh, Alhamdulillah. So, yeah, I'm even sure. though I don't want to be here, it's good to be here because this man has taken excellent care of me. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and then Allah pray, inshallah. And, uh, yeah. and then, like I said, uh, uh, as Dr. Omar already knows also, that if anyone wants to support, send funds, please do that. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I have enough funds, but if you send, then, then you can t partake in the blessings. And then uh, also um, do dua. Inshallah, everything goes well with Dr. Umar. And uh, do dua for me too. It's Ramadan. We should do dua for each other. Alhamdulillah. And uh, so we'll end our conversation for today, inshallah, here. And we will continue, inshallah, if Allah wills, tomorrow. Yes, inshallah, tomorrow. Inshallah. I think this has been a good, uh, a good exchange. I, I'm sorry if I talk too much. You oh, just, no, no, you no. Just no. stop me. Uh, no, people are always telling me that I'm inter, inter, uh, interrupting you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that uh, when you were far away, yes. sometimes the, the audio would overlap. Yes. It would seem like I'm interrupting you. Yeah. Well, and sometimes I get so caught up in the zone, like a conversation. Yes, yes. That, uh, that you know, I, I feel like, oh, let me just say this. And especially, as you know, uh, part of my, I see my role as like interjecting the, the Quranic aspects into yes. that. And so I bring those out. Yes. Well, and, and so tomorrow, inshallah, if we, if we continue this, why don't you open up with your reflections this evening over this conversation? And then we'll take the next step wherever Allah leads it. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we'll talk, we'll continue on the same subject about, because we still want to talk about suffering and hellfire and, uh, all all yeah. those aspects. Mm, okay. But today was a good understanding of why we're in this situation. Mm, yeah. Why? How inshallah. we got to this situation in the first place. So, inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Do dua for us. Assalamu alaikum.